Okay, just so everyone's aware, we are recording. Okay, we have about three more minutes. So Mary, when are you gonna retire? Mary, sorry. that's all right. Mary, when are you gonna retire? Uh, when people start stop telling me stories that get me too engaged to quit working. <laughs> understand i keep saying i'm retiring but then <laughs> trey riley is a daughter of a friend slash client so you don't ever turn down friends so that's right <laughs> unless for whatever reason you need to turn it down because they're friends there's that but fortunately i don't have to worry about that I mean, I, I just say that's not my field of law and, you know, get somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Because I only do one tiny little field of law. All right. I see this won't be, this won't be long. It will take Olivia longer to present her start, then it will take me to argue, I think, or roughly the same. We all well, aim for short meetings in December. <laughs> I was going to say, I learned some uh, patience today because I had to go down by the Fashion Place Mall this afternoon for a little while. Oh, that sucks. It was I'm sorry. Truly dreadful. <laughs> Yeah. I live in a neighborhood adjacent to the Fashion Place Mall, and I dread <laughs> getting home this time of year. It's a nightmare. It's horrible. Yeah, I just dread it as well because it's just a sunset here in Costa Rica, and it's stunning. You would not like me if I took the camera out to my party and showed you the party and the sunset. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> that sounds nice. I was arguing a case in front of the Tenth Circuit, and I had my screensaver was my during COVID, and the screensaver was my house in Costa Rica. And at the end, I asked the court, I said, I'm out of time, but I'm happy to take any questions you want to give me. And one of the judges on the Tenth Circuit said, Mr. Baird, your screensaver looks lovely. Tell me you're not there. And I said, you're right, Your Honor, I'm not there, uh, but I wish I was. Okay, hey, we have a time of five o'clock, if we could get started, okay. please. Okay, we're here for uh, a variance hearing under the auspices of the Salt Lake City Planning Division. My name is Mary Woodhead. I'm the hearing officer today. Um, the matter before us is PLNZAD 2023-00837. And it's a variance request for side and rear yard setbacks at approximately 649 South 300 East. This is a public hearing, so we'll have an opportunity for um, public comment if anyone wants to raise something. I have read all the materials, the staff report and the materials submitted by the applicant. So we don't necessarily need to repeat all of that. My um, planned preferred way to go forward today unless everyone objects is to hear from the applicant and applicants council first because i understand the basis of the request and then hear from salt lake city staff um, and any response they have at that point i will open the public hearing so that any members of the public who are here who wish to speak will have an opportunity for input and then I'll bring it back um, and allow the applicant and the city to provide any additional information. I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to say everything they need to say. Um, so are there any objections to moving forward in that well, that's, manner? That's fine. Okay. So I think you, Bruce, will start. Thank you. Uh... And, and I appreciate it, Mary, and I knew you would have read everything, so I never make it a practice of re rehashing anything in a briefing. I'm going to discuss a little bit about the theory and history of variances um, and how that theory and history of, of variance law applies to this case. 
And that's going to be about it because it's not going to be very difficult. Uh, I, I think it's important to talk about the theory and history because most people don't understand where variances come from and how they came to be. Unfortunately, I'm old enough and I've been doing this long enough that I actually do understand the theory and have litigated it uh, more than once. But the most important part is you, you understand that what someone was trying to do was legal at the time they tried to do it. But the at the time, the facts on the ground were established. But then a change in zoning law has made what they want to do illegal in some way. The two classic examples I always use to explain variances are uh, a, a cul-de-sac and a slope variance. Uh, a cul-de-sac, let's, let's hypothetically assume that there's a cul-de-sac that was platted um, 50 years ago, uh, and it had, say, 10-foot setbacks, uh, front yard setbacks, and 10-foot side yard setbacks. So there was a decent pie-shaped uh, lot that you could build on. But let's just assume, as not assume because it's what happens, is that the local government decided at some point in the future that the setbacks should be 20 feet in the front and 15 feet on the sides, which shrinks what people can do. So instead of being able to build a house similar to what everybody else in the neighborhood builds, they're in, only able to build a tiny little house um they can build it it just it's a shed it's just a tiny little shack the same thing applies on many cases where cities and counties adopt foothill slope ordinances at the time the subdivision was platted the lot may have had a buildable pad of say 5000 square feet on which you could have easily put a 3000 square foot footprint house but because of the slope that entire footprint almost all went away and you could build only a tiny little house again. And those are the classic cases of variances. And this is essentially the same case as that. At the time this lot was created, at the time the building was built, it was way before zoning. At the time the lot was created, it was way before zoning. So there is an existing house of only about 947 square feet. I wanna point out that it is a one bedroom house with one bathroom. So, and it was a landlocked lot with an easement access. So none of this was self-created. It was all prior to the zoning code when absolutely anything would have been allowed uh, when, it was, when it was built. So what you've got is you've got a situation where my clients are trying to get what I believe to be a substantial right, property right, and that is a right to build a house somewhat similar to the houses in the neighborhood. And we did an exhaustive research to show what the houses in the neighborhood are. It is extraordinarily rare to have a one bedroom, uh, one bathroom house almost anywhere in the city of Salt Lake City. And I think that contrary to what the staff says, I believe that having a right to a realistic house as opposed to a tiny little house is a substantial property right. This is the one place where I'm going to take a little bit of um, offense at the staff. Yes, ma'am. Nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm, I'm automatically Pavlovian conditioned that when I hear somebody say something in my presentation, I assume it's the judge and I always stop. Uh, so... I want to take a one but little... I, I do want you to talk a little bit about this substantial property, right? I, I will um, do that. I, know, I read, you know, the description of the house. I understand some of the limitations, but there are small houses. Um, I, so, I, I, I so understand that. It, so, and I'll so get to that. I will, I will get to that in a minute. Uh, the, the one point I wanted to disagree with the staff report on, the staff report says that having this house is a quote privilege close quote no it isn't it's a right uh and uh, there's utah case law essentially that essentially the uh, unfettered right to develop a property barring legal zoning is is a right not a privilege I, I, sometimes planners 
uh, think that they grant the rights as opposed to the rights are granted inherently um, and they're limited by a privilege lim given to the city, but not limited by the right. So I want to talk about the issues of a variance. This obviously isn't self-created. There's no harm to the general zoning plan. There's no harm to the neighborhood. There's It is not an economic hardship because the cul-de-sac and the slope examples I indicated were similarly hardships because you could build something, it's just pointless to build it. In this case, you could theoretically go up high, quite high in this property, but that's not what we've got. It's also theoretically possible that they could build in the front, but that's not how the house is configured and it would be uh, impractical to build in the front. So, you know, an economic hardship is more like when somebody says they need fewer parking spaces so they can build a bigger building so they can make more money. So it's not an economic hardship. It's not, it's it's as close as I can find in, a, in my, unfortunately, 40 years of experience in this field. I've never seen a more clean um, one owner, no harm, no foul variance request in my entire life and my entire career, and I've never heard of anything more. So let's talk about a substantial property right. And I'm going to again use the uh, analogy of the foothill variances and the cul-de-sac variances. In each of those contexts, and I've litigated both of them on, on both of those contexts, the fact that you can build something but not what your neighbors have and what is generally in the neighborhood is what I believe to be the case of substantial property rights. And in this case, I think it is in some ways, and I don't think I believe the law is relatively clear, it is an evolving tradition of what your neighbors have creates the the assumption of the rights. And in this case, we exhaustively researched the size of the houses in the area. And I don't believe that any of them are one bedroom, one bathroom. So I think with all due disregard for Justice Scalia, you don't look at the original intent of what something was you recognize that the law of a substantial property right is an evolving concept, and it depends on the neighborhood. I once had the Board of Adjustment in Salt Lake City grant a variance for a three-car garage, a side yard variance for a three-car garage in a neighborhood where three-car garages were essentially the standard. But whatever, I mean, I think that was probably egregious, but I was happy to win it for the client. But whatever you may think of that, a 947 square foot home with one bedroom and one bathroom is not anywhere near what is being enjoyed. And notice it says a property right enjoyed by the neighbors, by the by the area. I'm not, I'm paraphrasing the, the language. You clearly got involved after they submitted their appeal. No, um, actually I helped on the appeal and okay. I helped, I helped, uh, they, we've been, I've been working with Trey and Riley for a year approximately to do the title report, to determine where the history was, uh, to evaluate all the properties in the area, and to Can generate. Can you uh, send me some of the case law about the property right as it relates to the neighbors? I can research it. I haven't done it in a long, long time, Mary, but I will be happy to okay. do that. It may take me a week or two to get it to that's, you. That's fine, as long as your clients are okay with the delay. Yeah, I mean, they've been they've been patiently waiting to try to get this. Uh, I will. I will I have. Just, go ahead. Okay, those case law. That case law isn't in the materials I received. It it, you know, I know that I have read some of those cases, but it is you know, not. It, it is not in there. And it's be, not, I will be happy to brief it. I will be okay, happy don't to, brief. to fully brief it, but you know, just a short. I will. I will be to happy to give you that. City. It may take a couple of weeks because I'm in Costa Rica now, and then I'm uh, out of the country again in early January. But yes, I will get. I will get you the case law on what a substantial property right is, and that's my other main disagreement 
with the city's staff report, which seems to imply that if you have as much of a, as a shack that you can live in, then that's all you're entitled to. Uh, I would ask the city where they draw the line. I mean, if I had a 500 foot house with, with, one, with a half a bathroom and a tiny little bedroom, would that be sufficient? Somewhere there's gotta be a line drawn as to what the property right is. And I su submit that the case law and the statute itself relates to what is commonly found in the neighborhood. And what's commonly found in the neighborhood is not a tiny little one bedroom, one bathroom property. But I think that's the key issue. Okay, John, do you have any objection to having Mr. Baird submit some case law on that issue? No, not at all. And obviously the holidays right now, timing is always a little off. I think everything takes longer to get anything done. So I think it's fine. I, I don't think, think I've ever met John before. I, it, I know Olivia, but I don't know John. I've been around. I've been here about 14 years. So we've crossed paths a few times, I mean, but, no, I just, I mean, but it has I mean, been a while. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. If I'm, I'm terrible yeah. with names and, and on the little Zoom screens, I can't always recognize faces, John. Yeah, the name but like John asked, Anderson is pretty forgettable, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me point, ask you this question, Bruce. If someone intentionally builds a small house, yeah, um, and then the and it's smaller than the other the other neighbors because they want a smaller house, they want a smaller footprint, um, and then the next person buys it, so that house was small intentionally. Yep. Does that next person then have the right to no? Because that's that's a self-created hardship. They bought it. The first person who built it built it knowing what they were building. The person who bought it knew it what they were buying, and they knew what the law was at the time. So I think that would fall under the self-created hardship rule, Mary. Okay. Okay. Do and you that's have why, any? That, that's why I wanted to be point to point out. We carefully researched the history of this. Uh, I I spent hours with Trey and Riley and their title company going back to try to find out how this weird lot got created with that weird access. This is a case that is flat out sui generis as far as I can tell uh, in that you're never going to find a lot like this with a tiny little house in this zone with this limited access. And, and I know I shouldn't say never because there's always a, another one, but this is an extraordinarily um, dissimilar situation to anything else that I've ever heard of. Okay. Um, this The staff report suggests that rather than expanding in the way they've proposed, they could expand on the side yards, which I think are north and south. Well, it'd be the front. I think the staff report says the front yard and the side yard, if I remember correctly. Okay. So do you have any response to that? Yeah, the response is it simply doesn't work. It would require essentially a, a rebuild of the house as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, a simple, reasonable addition. So it could be done. And that's why I brought up the uh, preemptively brought up the question of whether it's an economic hardship or not. Because as you know, in the land use profession, there is no such thing as an engineering problem. There's only a financial problem. They could tear the house down and build something huge. Uh, they could build in the front yard. They could do all of those things. It just doesn't make any sense given the configuration of the existing home. And that doesn't mean it's an economic hardship. It just simply means they're being denied the rights of what their neighbors are having. Okay, so the, here's the staff report. The recommendation says that an inline addition can be accommodated on the north and south side yards. So that doesn't work from your the south. The, the south is really not a side yard. The south is a front yard. Uh, the, the south is where the entry comes in and it would require a complete reconstruction of the house. You wouldn't have the same entrance point. You'd have to just, you'd have to re rebuild a front end of the house to do it. Okay. Right. The reason the house itself faces um south. So that south yard is maybe functionally the front yard, but the way our, our code is written, um, 
because you, the access is from the I just east. Pause for one minute, can you identify yourself for the record? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm Olivia Savetko, principal planner in the Salt Lake City Planning Department. And okay. Olivia is Olivia is right. I mean, it, it's the technical definition makes it a side yard, but the reality is that it's a front yard, which again proves the unique situation of the property and the the reason that the project is the reason that the code is essentially more binding than it should be because it's definitionally weird here. Okay. Okay. Are you, should we hear from Olivia now? I'm, I'm you, done. Okay. Okay. Olivia, do you want to respond? Absolutely. Um, yes. So like I said, the, the front yard is to the west because that's the direction the access is coming from the way our code is written, which does make this lot uniquely shallow, only about 45 feet deep with setbacks that leaves a five foot building envelope, as you know from the staff report. Um, the existing building encroaches already into those required front and rear setbacks. And uh, although it's a unique lot and it's uh, in, it's unique in how shallow it is. Our code does specifically address properties in this type of situation saying you can um, build additions to these structures that were much tinier at the time they were built typically. We can add additions in line with the existing non-compliance so long as it doesn't increase the non-compliance or create a new non-compliance. So it, that to me means that the variance being requested does not meet the requirement that it be the minimum variation necessary to relieve an unnecessary hardship. Um, and I think that that is, is really maybe the main sticking point here. Okay. Okay, and it does seem that the city acknowledges that there is a hardship associated with the size of the lot, the size of the house, that that piece of this is not in dispute. Yes, the, the lot is certainly unique from those around it, um, but our code does have provisions that, um, that address lots like this. Being an old city, we run into lots with unique issues. Um, so there, there is room on this lot for an addition. Like mentioned, I'm sure it would be a much more difficult addition to construct. Um, but going off of our standards for variances and what is and is not allowed to go through, it's just greater than the minimum necessary to relieve the hardship. And the addition to the north in the side yard is not related to the hardship of the shallow lot. And I would respectfully disagree, but I appreciate her opinion and her concise uh, answer. But we think it is the minimum necessary because it's, it, we're not asking for a monstrous expansion. It's a simple, small, no harm, no foul expansion. This is a, this is a simple fact where the city's technical rules, if applied as the city is trying to do, requires something of a landowner that seems to me, and I think is relatively clear, uh, unrealistically difficult when there's an easier way to do it. Thank you way, which is the easier way to do it. And rearranging the complete house and how it sits on the property because of the weird definitional issues of side yard and front yard, seems to me to be an awful lot more difficult than simply saying build in the side in the rear yard where no one cares and where there's no practical difficulty in doing so. So I think you have to carry some practicality into this and variances have a practicality component to them. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Is there anything else from the parties before I open the public hearing? Uh, unless I don't have anything, unless Trey and Riley want to say anything on their behalf. Um, and obviously there's nobody on for the public, but uh, I'm not sure what they would, they, they may want to say something 
Um, and if they do, that's great. If not, then I'm done. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, and no. if you do, please identify yourselves before Hi. you speak. Okay. Hi, I'm Riley, and, and this is Trey Gardner. We're the gardeners who are um, applying for the variance. We appreciate everybody's time, and and we really just agree with, with everything Bruce has pointed out. I don't think we have anything extra to add. Just thank you so much for the time, and we hope you'll consider our unique situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, Aubrey, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there anyone here online who wishes to speak? Um, there is no one in the attendees list. Um, I did want to bring out that according to policies and procedures, Bruce, if you could please um, send those written materials to us and we can forward them on to Mary. I know you guys know each other, but just to follow procedure. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's, I fully anticipated doing it in that fashion. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we've heard from everyone who's present. Does anyone have any last words? Anything else they want to let me know? Anything I've missed? Anything you think is critical? How about have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year? Well, thank you. Okay, I'm going to take this under advisement. I'm going to wait for the submission. Oh, go ahead. I do, I, I do have I do have one obvious last point, and that is the case law, as you know, is uh, essentially that if there's a, a close call, an ambiguity of any kind as to what constitutes a substantial property right, et cetera, then any ambiguity uh, pursuant to a score of Utah cases and pursuant to now we've codified it has to be construed in favor of the property owner. So and I don't you, need those cases. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I, I knew you didn't need them, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that. So if there is in any ambiguity as to what constitutes a substantial property right, um, then we win. Okay. I do want to add one last thing, which is that after Mr. Baird submits his case law, I'm going to give Salt Lake City 10 days to respond. Um, if for some reason the timing of when he submits makes that 10 days not an appropriate time period, let me know and I'll be flexible about that. But just in case the city has a response to what Mr. Baird submits, I want to allow for that opportunity. I appreciate that. And obviously, we're big boys and girls and professionals here. So we're going to treat each other professionally. And um, Olivia has been great. Uh, so we're uh, we appreciate it. OK, I appreciate everyone's time tonight. As Mr. Baird said, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays. Um, have a wonderful rest of your evening and thank you. Talk to you all later. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Good night. Thanks for your time. Bye.